Hamilton, I think we've become so tribal and we're so we're only willing to hang out with people that read the same papers as us and vote the same way and, you know, feel the same on certain topics. And I just think it's so healthy to challenge yourself and hang out with people that sometimes you fundamentally disagree with. Hello. Oh, mate, how are you? I'm good. It's always good to see good. you. Good, likewise. It's been a while, actually. I was I, trying to think. I know. It was a few years it back. Might, you were in, must have been. in the studio. Good to yeah. catch up. You yeah. know, us, us, the BBC Three lot. That's exactly cut right. Cut our teeth and it's BBC true. Three at the same time. What, in the... Early noughties. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'd have, oh, yeah, I'd have followed your footsteps. Um, but yeah, I mean, I started when I was 20. I was 37 last week. Congratulations. Imagine that. I've been doing this for like 17 years. Isn't that yeah. wild? And you started, I mean, I, it's it's amazing how you started because you started by being part of a documentary. Was it Blood, Sweat and Tears? Yeah, Blood, Sweat and T-shirts. T-shirts, yeah. 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 That so was, and you were, you, were, you were sent out, weren't you, to, to the sweatshops? In, was it Thailand that you oh, went? So I went to India. India. So I, the premise was really straightforward. So essentially they were looking for like six young Brits who yeah. were complicit really when it came to like fast consumerism, fast fashion, throwaway disposable fashion. Um, and it was such a phenomenon. And then they took us over to India and it was so immersive. I mean, it was like they sort of threw us in at the deep end and sort of really understood, my goodness, like there's all these kids making these clothes and they're being paid nothing an hour and, you know, reality sort of sort of hit. Um, and then I just got my own gig off the back of that. Yeah. So it was only ever meant to be a one-off. You know, I was only ever meant to contribute to that particular series. And then, Did you uh, ever, before that happened, were you ever aspiring to to work in television, to be a presenter? Because no. they, I remember, I mean, you know, look, we all worked for the same people at BBC Three. Danny Cohen was, a, a, was there at the time, yeah. uh, running BBC Three, and then he went on to run BBC One. And they looked at you, I remember, in, in the documentary, and they went, there's something <laughs> in this girl. We need to see more of her. Um, and, and then the rest is history, really, because you've been making documentaries now for so long. Yeah, isn't it funny how it all plays out? And I never take it for granted. And that's the thing, Danny, um, yeah. was just such a gen. I mean, because I'm sure there must have been other commissioners... Um, you know, his counterparts must have been thinking, what on earth are you doing? You know, she's she's inexperienced. She didn't study journalism. She left school at 15. But he, I remember him saying to me, don't feel, you know, there'll be this temptation to conform. Don't sort of cave into that. Your authenticity and your sort of, your empathy and your, your genuine curiosity is what I'm after. Um, so it's, yeah, it served me well. I've been really lucky. And it is exactly that, really, which is your incredible skill set. The fact that you go to these places, and my goodness, you've been to war zones, mm. you've been to... I don't know why it's came to me, sex shop, shops in Japan. Oh, I've been to a lot of sex you shops. You really have. That, that, <laughs> I can't remember which part of the documentary that was, but it was... You were incredible because you have to deal with some really difficult issues but you're always you. So how do you manage that? How do you manage to try and be always you? I never take the access for granted. So whenever right. I'm having a conversation with these individuals, I think, do you know what? They don't have to talk to me. Mm. So there's always a kind of, on a very human level, there's always that, sort of element of respect there and I think that's actually what works well with the sleeps over series so you're kind of you're walking you know they're allowing you into their home which feels hugely personal and then you're asking often quite robust questions um and it you know I don't think it has to be unnecessarily confrontational I've said this before um but you have to sort of ask the questions that the people will be screaming at the telly at home yeah. so I just yeah I try and kind of I try and kind of keep it informal and just but is there that conflict though because you're absolutely right you you your brain goes I know what people want to ask at home mm. but I've just spent half a day with this person they're a lovely person and I don't want to upset them <laughs> but I have to go there it's the how dynamic, do, you, how I do know. you deal with that especially with sleeps over because you know you'll be talking about something I don't know you might be talking about um in the UK series, for example, a couple of years ago, there was this movement, the trad wife movement. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that, you know, the women were sort of subservient and they were there to serve the men essentially. And they were very much like, you know, they sort of said what was going to happen in the household and, you know, kind of going back to those old stereotypes that I found sort of quite unhelpful. So you'd sort of be thrashing that out. Um, but then you'd have to say to them, oh, could you just 
could you just show me how to work your shower as well? Because, um, and can I borrow your shampoo? Do you know what I mean? So it's like sort of always slightly awkward. But um, I suppose that's what makes it so unique. Yeah. Let's look at where you were staying over in the US. Yeah. Uh, we're back to sex shops again. Well, you not know quite. Me. <laughs> you stayed in that, it's a very famous brothel yeah. in Nevada, which is uh, the Mustang Ranch. It's, it's outside of Vegas, isn't it? Yeah. So it's uh, in, in the state of Nevada, it's entirely yeah. legal, yeah. Um, which I think is brilliant. And for me, it's like, that's the way forward. You mm. know, the girls are kept safe. There's a duty of care. Condoms are mandatory. Um, they've got panic buttons. Um, they've got doctors on site. They've got security. So, yeah, you know, the kind of... The punters are never going to push their luck or treat these women with any kind of malice or disrespect um so the girls were a scream i mean they were you know they were such good fun um and i really heard it all you know because they were like we were all kind of bear in the, mind this is a family show the, yes yeah. and, I, and it's sort of saturday and it's, <laughs> yeah. yeah i yeah saturday pre afternoon shed, pre yeah. Shed. um but it, yeah no i i heard it all and it was um it was brilliant i had a great time i arrived on the friday i wasn't the only person that had a great time uh, i arrived on the friday and left on the monday um, but, you know, very articulate, very um, eloquent, uh, great girls with a lot to say. Yeah. And you spent time with a Mormon family. Not at the brothel, I should say. No, that was this elsewhere. Was in uh, Hot Springs, South Dakota. Yeah, and, you know, South Dakota was beautiful. It was mm. so beautiful. And you know what? The States, I mean, it's so vast and you've got so many different communities that you can sort of tap into. But he was interesting, the main character within that family, a guy called Jeff... Um, so they were polygamists um, and they'd actually been rejected from the mainstream Mormon church. Um, and he had two wives and he was actively searching for a third. Um, and I've said this was before. Was that the purpose of your sleepover? Well, no, I think I wasn't. No, we weren't really into each other, <laughs> Jeff and I. Um, but he was. He was a good sport. And that's the thing. Like, on paper, he's a bit of a misogynist. Right. And um, a, a bit... I would say he sort of contradicted a lot of what he said he stood for. But he was, you know, he was up for really interesting conversations. And, and so when you when you want to challenge somebody like that, yeah. it, it, is it a lot harder when you're staying over? Yeah, because of course it, yeah. I can do that if they come on the show and I can interview them. It's a but, neutral but space. I don't, I, yeah, I, yeah. Don't, I don't have to sleep in their spare room afterwards. Exactly right, exactly right. And that's what I always say to them. I say, Jeff, look you know, you're going to say things that I don't necessarily understand and vice versa. And it mm. doesn't mean that, you know, I'm right and you're wrong or, you know, it's it's just a difference of opinions. And I think we've become so tribal and we're so, we're only willing to hang out with people that read the same papers as us and vote the same way and, you know, feel the same on certain topics. And I just think it's so healthy to challenge yourself and hang out with people that sometimes you fundamentally disagree with. Um, Do you think we've lost, the skill to do that. Um, I mean, particularly when you look at social media. I notice you're not as much on social no, media. No, I'm off Twitter. Yeah. It's yeah. just it became such a cesspit. And I just thought I'm sort of... The thing is with Twitter, for example, maybe that's a good point. It's like, you know, we were there to converse and think, oh, I hadn't seen it from that point of view before. Mm. Well, actually, that's a really valid point. But now, I think over the years, it's become about winning and shouting and mm. kicking off and the art of debate or conversation is lost. So, so have you found that being the same in real life when you go into these houses and sometimes you challenge people on their views on mm. life do you find that the skill of sort of communicating with someone you disagree with has been eroded because of social media or do you think actually social media is not really a fair reflection of where humanity is because ac the truth is the majority of the world is not on social media and perhaps yeah. the majority of the world can actually disagree agreeably well, that's what I've found, certainly with this series. And again, Jeff's a good example of that. So we have very different viewpoints on certain things. But actually, do you know what? He was so accommodating. We ate together. His kids were a delight. And I did love hanging out with him, you know. I And I've found that before, you know, families when I've worked in the States. For example, there was a lady who was a gun dealer. I mean, I... You know, I, I can't pretend to understand the obsession that some Americans have with firearms. But there was lots that she was about that I could get on board with. So, I yeah, I, I enjoy hanging out with lots of different people from lots of different sections of society. And do you find that they change you? 
Yeah. Do, do, do your views change sometimes? Yeah, and I, I think that's, I think that sort of illustrates that you've really listened as well. There's no point going into an environment or a space and thinking I'm not willing to mm. allow the needle to move. You know, I think what it I think... It also makes and, for, for powerful telly, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, I don't think you always have to dig your heels in. I mean, some things are non-negotiable, you know, inciting hatred, of course, all of that. But, you know, sometimes you can see things that you hadn't taken into consideration prior and then you think, oh, actually, yeah, no, I totally hear you. And isn't it exciting? I remember when I made a documentary again, for, it was back in the BBC mm. Three Days. It was about, I made it about gambling addiction my dad was a gambling addict but what i found it was my first documentary that mm. i'd ever made um because before that doing the real hustle was you know it was sort of scripted in the sense that we knew what we were gonna do we didn't know how it would pan out because it was all hidden cameras but this was the first documentary and what i found exciting about documentary making is that there is no script and you mm. don't know where it's going to take you yeah and that's actually, is it exciting or is it petrifying I for you? I love it, yeah. yeah. I love following actuality. Of course, you know, when you're putting a documentary together, you kind of have a loose idea of the kind of topics that you might stumble across. But um, you always bump into somebody that you hadn't anticipated yeah. or there might be someone, you know, as you're sort of walking to the shops that kind of chips in and... Um, you're just able to react, and I love all that. You know what I mean? I really, really love that. Has there ever been anyone, because you've met such an array of people <laughs> in your career doing all these docs, has there been someone that you've said, right, that's, that's it, I'm, I'm ending it here, I can't, I'm, I, I'm not willing to speak or engage further with this person? Um, I think you have to be mindful in terms of who you're willing to give a platform. Mm. I think sometimes if they're being bombastic for the sake of being bombastic or they're kind of trying to kind of encourage clickbait, I'm less less interested in entertaining that. Um, but that's, again, with the sleep sofa, you know, we've got families that don't feel, you know, typical or ordinary. But... Um, they're just really, really interesting. And, yeah, you come away thinking, actually, we should just be a bit more open-minded about most things. Now, a couple more questions yeah, before we go. Uh, the, you know, since I last saw you, you won Strictly. Is that... I, have... I don't think I've seen you since you won Stop. Strictly. And you've got a 14-month-old oh, daughter. My little girl. She's magic. She's how, really great. How Are you still dancing? And we know Kevin's still dancing, your partner, who you watched, who won Strictly with. I know, what a cliche. How cheesy. It's wonderful. Oh, Come on. It's a great cheesy. story. It's a I great wish I was, story. I wish I was a but how cooler. are you finding motherhood? And are, do you still give the old foxtrot in the uh, living room? Listen, I love dancing. I'll always say to Kev, I sort of joke that I'm always desperate to sort of work on my frame and have a bit of a, you know, go around. Give us the a kitchen. bit of a twirl, Kev. Um, but he's not, <laughs> unless he's being paid. <laughs> You know, he's less enthused. He's like, oh, stay. So, you know. It's a bit like you probably if you kept asking, can you do this quick interview for me? Not now, Kevin. Uh, but I love dancing. I always sort of put the radio on in the morning and, you know, I'll have a dance with my little girl. Um, she's like, what on earth is going on? She's just trying to sort of play with her little piano that she's completely in love with. Um, but no, it's, I mean, you'll know more than me. It's completely, um, it's a real, it's just a, an entirely different way of living now, you know? Yeah. So your priorities completely shift. I see everything through a different lens. Um, yeah, the usual sort of um, predictable answers, but she's great. She's great. Look, it's been such a pleasure. Thanks so much Likewise. for coming in. It's no, so good to, to see, see you. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Stacey Dooley Sleeps Over USA uh, returns in March on W and it's also available on UK TV Play. And of course, all the previous series are available to stream for free.